Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this week's IQUIST seminar. Let's go ahead and get started. Oh, is it? Okay, good. Uh, so this week we have the honor of having Alp Sipahigil visiting us. He is the Ping and Amy Chow Family Assistant Professor at Berkeley. He also has an affiliation at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, Elp's first research in the US was actually here at UIUC back in 2008. We worked with uh, Paul Quiot for a little while. He then went on to do a PhD at Harvard working with Misha Lucan, where he pioneered Silicon Vacancy Centers as a very exciting platform for quantum networking and solid state quantum optics. Uh, he was a, a finalist for the Debbie Jin uh, Daymop Thesis Prize for that work. He then moved to Caltech, where we overlapped for several years. We worked for Oscar Painter, both on optomechanics, realizing extremely high quality factors, and also in superconducting circuits, where they studied a lot of uh, quantum optics and many body uh, quantum physics with uh, superconducting circuits. Most importantly, perhaps, is sort of the marriage of optomechanics and superconducting circuits, where they realized a transducer from microwave photons to optical photons at the single photon level, which is quite exciting. So Elp is here to talk to us about defect engineered photonic and superconduct superconducting quantum circuits. So please join me in welcoming Elp. Thank you uh, for that very nice uh, introduction, Jake. Um, uh, hello everyone, I'm Alp. Uh, I'm a relatively new faculty at Berkeley. Uh, I started my new group in 2021, around the same time as uh, Jake. Um, so we were kind of from the same uh, batch out of Caltech. Um, and I'm gonna tell you about some of the new work we started doing uh, at Berkeley uh, in my new group. And specifically, I'll talk about how we can use defect engineering to develop next generation photonic and superconducting uh, quantum circuits. All right, before I start, I wanna acknowledge the team uh, who's actually behind this work. Uh, we're a new group, but uh, I'm already very lucky to be working with a very talented uh, group of students and postdoctoral researchers. And I also thank the, the following agencies and our institutions uh, for the support that enables this work. Uh, but before uh, kind of jumping into the research, <laughs> uh, this is how it all started, as Jake kind of alluded to this. Um, so I was an exchange student uh, visiting UIUC for a semester from Istanbul, Turkey. Um, and I sent an email to this faculty, you know, who was, who was like, now I guess it's, we ruined, ruined it a little bit, but uh, I was like, this quantum optics stuff sounds very cool. And uh, he was kind enough to let me do some research. If you haven't gotten the hint already, yeah, I was working with uh, Paul, Paul around that time. And it seems like the tradition is still going strong. Yeah, I, I, I like the work and I kind of stuck with it. So I've been since, you know, 2008, we've been doing work on quantum optics, mainly on with solid state systems. Okay, so here's my kind of, this is a already a specialized seminar series, so I'm not going to give a very broad overview, uh, but here's my kind of one slide motivation uh, where, you know, we're now at an exciting stage where, you know, quantum optics in 2008 was more about like curiosity driven research. Now things are starting to get a little more serious and there are now companies involved. Um, and we're now kind of thinking more seriously about how to scale quantum technologies. Uh, one, one important, uh, one useful uh, figure of merit is the so-called quantum volume, which was kind of uh, put forward by the IBM team, where essentially what it tells you is that if you want to build useful quantum technologies, you need some combination of large qubit counts, as well as low error rates and high fidelity gates. Okay, so, you know, I'm more of a device engineer at this point. I'm kind of consider myself to be like a quantum device engineer. But these are kind of the goals uh, that we try to reach. Um, and this is really hard. <laughs> I mean, a lot of you have already realized probably. Okay. Uh, yeah, I see the mic kind of doing its thing. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a really hard problem. Really, really hard problem. Uh, and, uh, there's, well, that means two things. There's, okay, open challenges, but also, you know, we're in academic institutions. So it also means that there's a lot of fun research opportunities. Uh, in particular, on the reducing error front, there's lots of things we need to understand in terms of device physics, 
materials, ways of doing con developing control uh, of these quantum systems in a scalable way. And then there are scaling challenges. How can we build integrated devices that could potentially scale beyond a million? How do we control them? How do we interconnect them with each other? And one of the fun things about this field is that it really merges several disciplines together. You need you know, help from anyone you can get help from, physicists, double E's, uh, material scientists, computer scientists, et cetera. Okay, so um, what my group does is to try to tackle some of these open challenges and try to develop integrated quantum devices. So when I say integrated quantum device, you know, what you should envision is some kind of chip. It's either electronic or photonic circuit where we try to engineer them uh, to uh, develop next generation uh, quantum technologies. So some of the things we do is to study device physics associated with these integrated quantum systems. We study new qubits, uh, control uh, readout and interconnect mechanisms. And also in a lot of the work that we do, what we like to do is to do it in a way such that in the future this can scale by using leveraging you know, billions of dollars or maybe trillion dollar investments in silicon foundries. So if we can do some of these technologies in silicon, it would uh, allow us to leverage that existing uh, you know, semiconductor manufacturing methods. So our long-term vision is to go from you know, your heroic physics experiment with you know, thousand wax cables to something that might look like this. This is more like a, you know, uh, what the state of the art is right now. We're basically dealing with vacuum tubes still, um, I think. Uh, we still haven't found what the transistor for quantum computers are, but that's part of the research, research agenda. All right, so in this talk, um, I'll highlight uh, two efforts um, from my group. I'll spend most of the time talking about a new platform that we're working on, where we're trying to develop AMO uh, type quantum information techniques in silicon using color centers, recently uh, rediscovered uh, color centers in silicon. I'm going to show some uh, results from our lab showing indistinguishable photon generation from defects uh, in silicon photonics, as well as some preliminary results from reconfigurable photonic crystal arrays that might help us scale these systems. And then if time permits, I'll talk a little bit about how we're using phononic engineering to improve superconducting qubit properties. All right, so here's a high level overview of where, you know, the, what the quantum device landscape looks like right now. Uh, some of the leading technologies, one of the leading technologies is superconducting qubits. These are great lithographically defined electronic circuits made out of superconductors. You can implement fast high fidelity logic operations with them, so they're pretty amazing. One limitation is that they often suffer from short coherence times. There's a lot of nice progress, but ultimately it's still uh, one of the open challenges. In contrast, there are systems like nuclear electron spins in solids, which can have really long coherence times. You know, people uh, in proof of principle experiments push this even to minute or an hour time scales. So these are really isolated, you know, textbook-like two-level systems. Uh, however, they're a little too isolated. So it's actually difficult to engineer interactions between them and to do gates, fast gates. And then there are photons. Uh, we love photons. They are great for uh, transmitting quantum information uh, with one uh, over long distances, but they don't interact with each other. And yes, so these are not real lightsabers. Light does not interact with, photons don't interact with each other. Okay, so we have these kind of different platforms, integrated photonics, superconducting qubits, spin qubits. Uh, each, I mean, at, at, at this point, you know, none of them have, can address all the things we want them to do. So one of the appealing uh, approaches is to explore hybrid device architectures where perhaps one thing we can do is use different physical platforms to do different tasks. For example, you could use your superconducting qubits as your processes, which is what they're good at. You can think about using things like nuclear spins or other systems as memories, and then use photons for communication purposes. Uh, so it's kind of like you know how computers were put together. I mean, now we're going into an all silicon approach if, if that Apple M1 processor is a system on chip. Uh, but you know, back in the day, we were using like magnetic memories and stuff, right? So it was it's kind of following along those lines. Uh, but the challenge now is you have these different quantum objects. How do you transfer states between these different physical domains? So you need to develop transducers and interconnects that can transfer quantum information between these different types of physical systems. So that's important for connecting uh, interactions, engineering interactions between these different modules. 
And another aspect of this is if you can really control these interactions between, let's say, spins and superconducting qubits, it actually helps you address the coherence problems as well. So understanding this multi-physics problem is really, really important, both in terms of the coherence as well as engineering. Um, so Jake mentioned this uh, work that we did uh, when I was at Caltech. So this was an experiment where we built a quantum transducer that uh, transduced a single photon from a superconducting qubit to an optical photon, um, where the motivation is that if you have two quantum processors in different dilution refrigerators separated by long, a long distance, you can't send microwave pulses across because you have a lot of thermal noise and a lot of loss. You need to go to the optical domain. Um, and we built a device that did the first demonstration of an optical photon generation from a superconducting qubit. So this is, I'm just flashing the results here. I'm not gonna talk about this, but there's a lot of fun engineering that goes into this. So this is a chip that we built. There's a superconducting qubit in here and nanomechanical and nanophotonic structure. Um, if you're interested in these kind of uh, work, I encourage you to kind of take a look at this paper. There's also a talk I gave uh, on YouTube if you want to check that out. But this was work at Caltech. Today, I'm going to talk about what we're doing uh, at Berkeley. And I'm going to start by talking our, about our uh, integrated quantum photonics effort in silicon. So here's uh, a brief introduction uh, to the qubits that we're working with. Um, so in my group, we're studying color centers in silicon. These are atom-like systems in solid. And in particular, there are two ingredients about these color centers that we care about. They have electronic and nuclear spins. These are good for storing quantum information and doing you know, single qubit gates or two qubit gates. And then uh, what's special about color centers is that they also have optical transitions. So you can interface these electron and nuclear spins with optical photons such that you can develop quantum memories or uh, develop protocols for remote uh, quantum communication. And there's been really nice studies in a variety of material platforms like diamond, silicon carbide, uh, like gallium arsenide or other indium phosphide quantum dots uh, in terms of realizing such spin photon interfaces. Um, but one of the challenges that I think still exists is that you know, these things like diamond, for example, are really scale. It's, you know, diamond is a hard material to work with. Uh, it's expensive. It's hard to make devices out of it. Uh, so what we like to do is to build large scale photonic circuits um, where um, you can scale these proof of, uh, proof of principle experiments to larger scales. So actually Chris is gonna be starting a really fun effort. There's been a lot of nice developments in silicon carbide and silicon carbide photonics. So I'm kind of really excited to see the developments uh, there as well. Um, so I want to give like a concrete example of uh, a color center to highlight some typical properties. So here you're looking at a so-called uh, silicon vacancy center in diamond. This is the system I worked on during my PhD. Uh, the defect consists of a silicon atom that has two neighboring lattice vacancies uh, placed inside the diamond crystal structure. Okay, so this, it turns out that this defect uh, has some electronic states in it where you can identify electronic spin states with long coherence times. And you can have optical transitions between some orbital state, orbital ground state and optical excite state. And these optical transitions, you know, depending on what background you're coming from, right? So uh, in AMO physics, we usually talk in frequency domain. Uh, in, I don't know, chemistry and spectroscopy, maybe picometers or so, but essentially these are atom-like narrow bandwidth transitions that are operating close to the theoretical limit. So these can support lifetime limited line widths, Fourier limited line widths. Um, and because we're working with these optical emitters, these color centers in solids, you can actually carve out the material around it to define photonic structures and make photonic resonators. So here's a SEM image uh, showing a diamond photonic crystal cavity uh, that we built around a defect. And by placing just a single impurity inside such a photonic crystal cavity, you can actually control the flow of light. So for example, in this level structure, if my qubit is in spin down state, it interacts with this laser field when I drive it. If it's in the spin up state, it does not. So by flipping the electron spin state, you can change whether this optical uh, resonator transmits light or reflects light. 
So this is kind of like an optical switch controlled by a single atom inside the solid. But this is kind of like a classical description. It turns out that this actually holds for making photon-photon gates as well. If you have a single atom, it allows you to realize photon-photon uh, photon interactions as well. OK, so these kinds of ingredients have been really utilized in the past few years. Here I'm highlighting some really beautiful work out of Ron Hansen's group at Delft and Misha Lukin and Marco Longcar's groups at uh, Harvard, where they were able to demonstrate a three-node quantum network uh, based on electron spins of uh, nitrogen vacancy centers. So that's worked out of Delft. So it's one of the kind of leading platforms for building a quantum repeater uh, in Europe. Um, and then the second experiment used the silicon vacancy electron spin inside the photonic crystal cavity to use uh, to demonstrate memory enhanced quantum communication. Uh, but I think it's also fair to say that um, you know, these are really nice, beautiful experiments. And I think our understanding from diamond color centers really kind of showed us that these, these things are real and you can engineer them. But I think it's fair to say that the integration and uh, scalable manufacturing of these diamond structures is, is still really hard. And another point is that these defects operate in the visible domain. So if you want to do long distance communication, you need to operate that telecom band. Uh, so I think we, we need some new uh, developments to address these challenges. So um, in my group, in order to address these challenges, we decided to just move to silicon photonics. So silicon is an extremely mature form. Uh, all of you are using it every minute of your lives, even if you know it or not. Um, and it's not just about electronics. It's actually a very mature platform for photonics and MEMS as well. Um, so the idea here is that what we want to do is basically leverage uh, this ton of expertise uh, that exists in CMOS photonics, MEMS, and packaging. And instead of, you know, take known atoms and build photonics around it, let's just figure out what kind of atoms we can engineer inside silicon. So that's the approach that we're taking in my group. Um, and there's been... Uh, and we're not doing this work in isolation. There's been like really nice, uh, encouraging developments in the past few years uh, based on pioneering work from uh, Stephanie Simmons, Mike Tuolt, and N.A. Strauss groups. Uh, it turns out that uh, people uh, reporting a, a, a diverse, you know, um, a set of uh, uh, color centers in silicon with really appealing properties. In particular, here I'm showing you some examples of various uh, defects in silicon, which have optical emission at telecom wavelengths. So that's really desirable for quantum communication and integrated photonics. Uh, so we can incorporate them into silicon photonics. And some of these defects, they also have electronic spins with long coherence times. Um, so here's a plot out of this paper showing basically a zoo of defects uh, people started seeing uh, and studying in silicon. Um, so here I want to kind of highlight some work that we're doing with uh, computational material scientists uh, uh, collaborators, where you know a lot of these work with color centers happens serendipitously. So basically, you know, someone notices some fluorescence out of their crystal, and then you try to figure out what the hell happened. And then, you know, the reason NV centers are so popular is because they exist in natural diamond, right? It was not designed or anything, right? So these things kind of happen accidentally by some, you know, uh, random sequence of events. And then we try to do cool, cool science with it. So we have this ambitious goal, uh, which is driven by some computational um, uh, collaborators, where what we would ideally like to do is to design defects with some desired properties. So we have a project where we're trying to see if we can use first principles to calculate and predict properties of these defects that are relevant for quantum information, such as symmetry, charge stability, spin multiplicity, excitation wavelengths, you know, phonon coupling, and so on. Uh, and uh, I'm not the you know, one leading this work, but uh, uh, here uh, I'll highlight some results from uh, my collaborator, Jeffra uh, Hautier, where they've used high throughput calculations. So they basically, um, you know, we, in discussions, we decided that, okay, here are the ions that I can implant 
here are the possible defects that I can create inside the lab. And they did high throughput calculations to predict the properties of different kinds of defects that you can form. So we looked at uh, about a thousand charged simple defects that you could form uh, in silicon. So it's a very complicated plot where uh, we show the excitation energies of optical transitions as well as the transition dipole moments. Um, and we kind of identified a couple of uh, promising leads, but this is a very ambitious task. So my computational colleagues, yes. My computational colleagues, they can calculate thousands of these things, but as an experimentalist, we can only try maybe like a couple at a time. So if you're interested in how the tools, I encourage you to check out the results here. We need all the help we can get. Um, uh, but you know, we'll see. The kind of the real goal of this is to develop a methodology. So once we can show that this computationally driven uh, defect design works, then we'll have new sets of tools. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. It it works. In hindsight, things work very well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we did benchmarking with known defects, so that works very well. But um, yeah, we'll see. I mean, I think the real test is, can you predict something and then go and do the experiments? So uh, that's, that's our goal. If we can do that even for once uh, over the next you know, year or two time scale, I'll be really, really happy because then it really opens up because compute power grows. Uh, and if we develop this methodology, things will only get better. But yeah, I do. if you're interested in this kind of stuff, I do encourage you to take a look at this paper and try, a, if you're brave, try a couple of these things. Uh, this is a new field and we need a lot of input. Okay, but we're also, you know, we, we have an effort, we're doing some of that, uh, but uh, in the lab, we're primarily uh, focused on two known uh, systems so far. The first is the so-called G-Center. So this is a defect, it's a kind of a, a complicated structure. It has two substitutional carbon atoms with a silicon interstitial. Um, for the purposes of this talk, you can think of this as just an optical two-level system. This G-Center does not even have spin, so it's kind of boring in that regard, but it's a good optical emitter. So what, what do I mean by good? It has a short excite state lifetime, so it's a fast emitter. It has a, a radiative lifetime of about what we, we think it's about 200 nanoseconds or so. So we first started experiments with this system because it's a nice platform to start seeing whether we can do quantum optics in silicon photonics. And more recently, we transitioned to working with T-centers. This is a more interesting system because it has both uh, a strong radiative transition. This time, it's about a radiative lifetime of one microsecond. So it's not as fast. It's somewhere in between you know, traditional color centers and rare earths. Um, but it has good spin properties with millisecond electron spin coherence and uh, up to second of nuclear spin coherence. OK, um, so I'll kind of go over some of our first experiments where we started studying these uh, quantum emitters in silicon photonics. So here's the device platform that we developed. What you're seeing here with dark gray is a silicon photonic waveguide. And on the left, we have a Bragg mirror. So this is a Bragg reflector. It's just a silicon that we pattern such that it reflects light at the wavelengths that we want. And then we create emitters inside this waveguide via ion implantation and annealing. And then we design a mode converter such that this guided mode inside the silicon waveguide is coupled to the lens fiber with high efficiency. So here are some a little more details. We use uh, standard silicon on insulator wafers. So this is now a material we can buy an eight inch wafer off. If you're a device researcher, it's nice to be working with wafers. So I like that. And then we take this wafer, we do carbon ion implantation to create these defects. Um, there's actually this defect creation process is pretty complicated. We don't fully understand it, but it works well enough for what I'll show today. Uh, and then we do standard photonics fab. So we design, we do lithography to design and etch these uh, silicon photonic structures. Uh, at the end of the day, if you have this uh, quantum emitter inside your silicon photonic waveguide, <coughs> you can collect the photons emitted into a single mode fiber with about 50% efficiency. In our simulations, it's about 70%, but uh, in the lab, we you know, regularly get about 50% or so. 
Um, and I have to say this was, you know, compared with, you know, work in Diamond in a new lab, we could start doing this in a matter of like a few, like five months or something. It's intrinsically because these are very standard tools of silicon photonics and uh, semiconductor manufacturing. Uh, and then we take these samples, we characterize them at cryogenics. Unfortunately, most of these emitters, if you want to do quantum optics with them, you need to cool them down. Um, and we use a four Kelvin cryostat. Um, we put this uh, chip inside the 4K cryostat. We have a microscope objective uh, that we can use to image the structures. And we have a lens fiber that's on top of uh, a piezo positioner stages at low temperatures. That way we can move this lens fiber around and couple into the structures that we care about. In the future, we can do fiber packaging and more engineering, but for a prototyping stage, this works quite well. Uh, and then if we do a raster image, if we look at the, take a fluorescence image of this uh, photonic waveguide, uh, in some of these structures, we can indeed see just a single atom, single defect that's emitting single photons into this waveguide. Also, let's look at some of the optical properties of these uh, emitters in silicon. So in this experiment, we basically do analysis on the photons that are coming out. We collect the light into a single mode fiber. We have a scanning fabi perot uh, uh, filter, some bandpass filters, and uh, we can also look at intensity correlations using superconducting nanowire detectors. This is what the emission spectrum looks like. Most, about 20% of the emission is into the so-called zero phonon line. That's the part that's useful for quantum optics. Uh, about 80% goes into the phonon sideband. That's not so useful. Uh, so we throw that out. Uh, we do indeed get uh, a good G2, which shows you that you are indeed dealing with a single photon emitter. There's some bunching dynamics, which tells you about the multi-level uh, nature of these defects, but I'm gonna, not going to go into those details. We get about 35,000 photons from a single emitter at uh, saturation. So overall, from excitation to detection, our system has a, about 0.04 system efficiency. A lot of that is limited by the quantum of efficiency of this defect. Um, and the defect indeed has a, a 4.6 nanosecond lifetime. So from these two measurements combined, we think that the quantum efficiency is somewhere around 10% for this defect. So it it's, could be better, uh, could be worse, uh, but it's workable. Um, and then we also uh, characterize the line width of these photons that are emitted, and they're about 2.8 gigahertz. So this line width is actually larger than what you would expect from the lifetime. So there's some excess broadening. So these are not as narrow as they should be. Um, so this was kind of an, but this was literally actually the first device that we made. Uh, and we were able to get the highest count rates from a single emitter in silicon and using traditional uh, silicon photonics tools. And um, this was just emission in a waveguide. By doing simple cavity QED uh, using photonic crystals, we, we think that even with modest numbers like Q over V of 1,000, we can reach a cooperativity of one already. Um, and in addition to kind of this characterization, we also wanted to actually do some slightly more advanced quantum optics to see whether these photons are good uh, and whether they can be made indistinguishable. So to do that, we did a time-delayed honga mandel interferometry um, where we pulsed uh, the emission from this defect. So we apply two successive laser pulses. You generate a first, laser, uh, first single photon, that's the blue one, and a second one, that's the red one. And we send them through this uh, interferometer. By delaying one arm, one arm of this Mark Xander interferometer, we can make the first and the second pulses overlap with each other. So we can look to see whether the two photons that were emitted at different times, whether they are indistinguishable from one another. Um, so this is kind of for the experts, but what we did here was change the polarization in one of the arms and then look at the interference visibility. Uh, so we got, uh, a HOM interference window of about 400 picoseconds, which you can use to translate into some effective line width for the emitters. This effective line width is a lot narrower than what we measured before, which was about two gigahertz. This is about a, almost a factor of 10 narrower. So what we think is going on here is that the noise, the excess frequency jitter you have has time correlations. So if you look at photons that were emitted 
only within uh, 25 nanoseconds of each other, they will be more indistinguishable. So this was kind of a nice surprise. Uh, so in fact, the numbers are a little better than what we were, um, what we thought we could get. Okay, so this is, um, and this level of indistinguishability is something we can engineer further by using cavities and per cell enhancement. Uh, so that's really encouraging as a first experiment uh, on the optic side, but this G center does not have any spin. So we can't implement any of the uh, quantum communication or repeater protocols. So in order to start working with uh, spin photon interfaces, we started investigating this uh, other defect called the T center in silicon. Um, this is also another complicated looking defect. It's really like a molecule. So you have two carbon atoms and a hydrogen that's attached to it, okay? <clears throat> and these uh, replace a single silicon atom in the lattice. So it's a very packed uh, structure. You take, you take out a silicon, substitute it, replace it with two carbons and a hydrogen. So if you look at the electronic uh, excitation spectrum of this, uh, the, there's a ground state and the first excited state is uh, at uh, 935 MeV above the ground state. So this corresponds to the O band uh, in, the, in telecom. And there's a second excited state called TX1, which is split maybe by about two MeV. It's actually this gap between TX0 and TX1 that determines the temperature you need to operate. So basically you need to have KT smaller than this two MeV, such that your excited state remains polarized. Uh, this is what uh, uh, the photoluminescence spectrum uh, looks like. And in terms of, we were curious to understand, we wanted to understand how uh, the electronic structure works. It turns out that interpreting this excitation of this defect is a little bit complicated and not that similar to standard color centers. So in diamond, you have a huge band gap and you have electronic states deep inside the band gap. So you have electronic transitions between different defect orbitals. Here we're working with silicon and silicon has a relatively small band gap of one EV. And for the longest time, people thought this, this stuff would not be possible because of that. Again, the band gap is just too small. Um, it turns out that stuff kind of works. So now we're trying to figure out how it works. Um, and it, in order to understand, we actually had to, you know, again, work with our collaborator, Jeffra Potier at Dartmouth. And they showed that the excitation involves taking an electron from the valence band edge and promoting it to a defect state. So we're not just working with localized defect orbitals, but we're working with electronic states that come from the valence band. And in general, when you're working with defects in silicon, you're gonna be interacting with either conduction band states or valence band states. So the nature of this excitation is more like a defect bound exciton with strong binding energy, if you're familiar with the uh, solid state uh, optics language. Okay, so this defect, partially because the nature of the excitation is a defect bound exciton, has a relatively long excited state lifetime of 940 nanoseconds, um, has a Debye Waller factor of about 23%. Uh, and there's this really nice work out of uh, Stephanie Siemens group where they show that the homogeneous line width can be really narrow at the at sub megahertz level. <coughs> so if you take a pristine silicon material um, that has very low defect concentrations, you can actually get an ensemble that's at the homogeneous line with them. So it actually starts working like a cold atomic gas if you take a pristine silicon crystal. But uh, we do devices, so we start messing those up. I'll get into that later. So this is the optical spectrum. And if you apply a magnetic field, you can split the different uh, Zeeman sublevels. In the ground states, you have an electron spin up and an electron spin down, the spin one half system. And in addition to that, thanks to the hydrogen, you also have a nuclear spin degree of freedom which gives you access to additional uh, good qubit states and you get a hyperfine splitting at the order of about a megahertz. And uh, these are uh, some ensemble spin properties that have been measured in uh, Stephanie's group. So these are kind of typical numbers you get for like spin systems that I also mentioned at the beginning of the talk. So this is actually really, uh, it has a lot of the ingredients uh, that we like. 
And I think we can just take these numbers and you know, start doing device engineering uh, on the photonic side to build uh, useful quantum repeaters. And we started doing that, so I'm gonna share some preliminary results uh, in that direction. So what you're seeing here is suspended beams of silicon that are supported by these disks. Uh, so this is kind of a weird looking structure. Um, there's a reason we're doing it this way. I'd be happy to answer if there are any questions. Um, and then we bring a lens fiber and then we study the, uh, the color centers inside these waveguides, these small nano beams. And we again have an objective, we can take images. Uh, we first do a photoluminescence measurement. So we do above band gap excitation and look at all the fluorescence coming out through the fiber. And uh, the mechanism here is that you create an electron hole pair when you're doing above band gap excitation, that electron hole pair gets trapped at the defect. And then you look at the uh, radiative recombination of the electron hole pair at the defect site. So when we do a raster image, we actually indeed see uh, bright uh, fluorescence uh, across the waveguide. And if we kind of park our excitation laser at the spot and then look at the emission spectrum, we indeed see this uh, emission from the TX1 and TX0 lines. So this is a photoluminescence spectrum of T-center ensembles in a waveguide. And in we, our lifetime measurements are also consistent with what's been reported in the literature. Yeah. Yeah, so there are these support structures. Uh, they actually make it a little brighter. Uh, yeah, so the waveguide goes, there's a mirror here. That's why it goes dark. And then there's a tapered fiber coupler over here. And then the bright spot here is because we have this support structure. So there's a little more silicon there. Oh, there's many here, there's many. Um, so this is a high density. We're not doing single experiments here. Yeah, I should have clarified that. So this is a, there's basically high density of these emitters across here, yeah. We're just doing ensemble spectroscopy. Um, and the next step is to do um, kind of high resolution spectroscopy. And in order to do that, you actually wanna you know, scan a laser and measure the line width of these defects. So here we send in a, a pulsed uh, resonant laser and then we look at the fluorescence uh, emitted in the phonon sideband. This is called photoluminescent excitation spectroscopy. Uh, one of the nice things about these experiments is that everything is in fiber. So if you kind of visit our lab, it's basically like a fiber optics, you know, uh, setup mostly. Uh, we have this, uh, you know, one objective on the top, but almost everything else is in fiber. So for these experiments, we couple the fiber and then uh, don't need to do any other optics really. So if we scan our laser, this is the um, uh, photoluminescence, photoluminescence excitation spectrum that we get. This kind of answers your question. So what you're seeing here is basically there are these like sharp peaks with some uh, random distribution. Uh, so what's going on here is that there's actually about, we estimate about hundred emitters inside this structure. There's some inhomogeneous broadening. Most of them are in this main peak. This is kind of similar to if you have an inhomogeneous like laser medium, similar type of effect. Uh, but there are some outliers here, which we can, zoom in and study, uh, we think that this is actually indeed coming from a single defect. And at this, uh, for if we look at this one isolated peak, we get a line with about two gigahertz, actually similar to the line width we measured for the G centers. Uh, we have not studied this systematically. This is just like one data set. Uh, we'll, we're kind of looking into understanding what limits this line width. We actually think that in this case, there was some thermal broadening. Um, and then, oh, that's weird. I was having a Zoom call showing this slide and I added this link in the chat. So there's this <laughs> awkward link. <laughs> in the middle. Um, please ignore that, ignore that uh, reference. Kind of curious what that is. Okay, so, uh, so here we've done um, spectroscopy of an ensemble of T-centers. And now what we're working is developing tools such that we can control a single spin photon uh, interface inside the photonic crystal cavity. So I'll kind of walk you through the device platform. Uh, this is what the device looks like from the side view. So this is our waveguide. Uh, it's suspended in vacuum. There are some additional structures here. So what's going on there is that you have this waveguide, it's this small box. It goes 
uh, into the into the uh, plane, and then there we add some electrodes uh, such that we can apply microwave fields to drive these spins, and then we release this structure uh, such that we have high Q uh, photonic crystal cavities. This is what the um, uh, top view of the structure looks like. So this metal over here is uh, such that we can apply microwaves. So there's this uh, coplanar waveguide, and we take the center trace, we meander it such that we're applying magnetic fields, RF magnetic fields, at each of the photonic devices. And uh, we have about, what, 10, 15 uh, photonic uh, crystal cavities and waveguides here. Um, here's a zoom in of what the photonic and microwave uh, components look like. There's a photonic crystal cavity in here. Uh, that's where we want to place the defects. And then this trace U-shaped structure is an aluminum trace for applying RF fields. Uh, so we've started fabricating these devices uh, with the goal of reaching a high cooperativity uh, with T-centers in photonic crystals. So here's uh, a, uh, a simulation of the expected mode structure of this photonic crystal cavity. And we measure a Q of about uh, 80,000 uh, or so. This is Q total. Q intrinsic is a little higher, uh, closer to 100K. And uh, these structures have good Q, small mode volume, and we think that we can get a per cell factor of about 2,000, which should get us close to this cooperativity regime. Um, and how do we actually uh, work with these uh, cavities? Uh, so once you fabricates uh, such a photonic crystal cavity, you know, you design it, you fabricate it, and then something comes out and it's never exactly where you want it to be, right? Because this is, you know, some kind of human-made object. It's not like, a, you know, clock transition of an atom. So you need some kind of uh, way of tuning these photonic, photonic crystal cavities. Um, this is our, <laughs> the way we do it. We basically bring in like a small tube such that we can condense some gas onto the structure and it changes the effective index. So we can tune the cavity resonance by about six nanometers. But this is really one of the aspects of our work that I really dislike. <laughs> and this tuning mechanism is really not you know, very nice. So you, ideally what you'd like is something a little more engineerable and scalable. What we'd like to do is to make arrays of these devices and have, have all of them work. Uh, so I'll present some uh, solution that we uh, developed, uh, which is where the idea is to not have just one cavity, but when you make one of these fiber coupling structures in a waveguide, attach many cavities onto the same structure. So what's going on here is that we have this tapered waveguide coupler that allows us to couple light from a fiber into a waveguide. And then we have this extended uh, photonic structure, which goes on maybe for like 100 microns. And the center trace here, that's the that's a standard waveguide, and we place photonic crystals about 400 nanometers away from this center trace. So photons that are going through in this center trace get evanescently coupled to the cavities. Okay, so using this approach, you can use a single bus waveguide to simultaneously couple to tens of photonic crystal cavities. So all of a sudden now, let's say you know we made a device, there will be like some variation in the cavity frequencies that come out. Now, since we can kind of make many of them on a single run, uh, our yield is much, much higher. So we can get this almost unit efficiency now. Unit. So there, there's a cavity here. So we, uh, this is a Bragg mirror and then we make a defect and we make 12 such defects at different locations. And they're at distinct frequencies. So I'll show you what the spectrum looks like. Uh, so when we first fabricate the device and we measure the reflection, what you see here is these you know, dips around here and they're disordered, right? Some of them are close to each other. Some of them are a few nanometers away. This is basically a, a consequence of disorder in nanofabrication. They're not identical to each other. There's some fab uh, imperfection. So um, what we'd like to do is take this kind of disordered spectrum and then come up with a way to tune it to a regular target grid of our choice. 
So here's how we do it. The first thing we do is we do this gas condensation. So basically just you know, let in some, some nitrogen. It condenses a, a thin layer of uh, solid nitrogen and shifts the cavity resonances by a few nanometers. This is not controllable at the individual cavity limit. So basically this is a global operation and it's very slow. It takes like tens of minutes to stabilize this. But this is our starting point. And after that, our goal is to tune these resonances to some target wavelengths of our choice. In order to do that, we started using this uh, selective uh, cavity uh, uh, tuning mechanism, where what we do is, let's say we have an initial spectrum that looks like the following. If you park your laser on one of these resonances, you're going to only excite that cavity, right? So you have you have a resonator, so you have resonant buildup of energy inside only one of the photonic crystal cavities. And if you drive the system hard enough, you can start heating it. Okay? So when we send enough laser power in, we can selectively heat up one of these cavities and boil off the nitrogen that we condensed on it. Okay? So from here onwards, it's just software and programming. We basically uh, start with this initial spectrum, and then we have an algorithm that says, go to the first resonance, send in on that first resonance until you reach this target wavelength. And then, you know, that while loop starts, you know, an hour later, you end up with cavities tuned to the target wavelengths of your choice. So this is what it looks like. Um, so we start with some, let's say, some distribution. And then in this highlighted region, we're tuning this specific mode. And you can see that all other modes are stable, are not tuning, while we can tune only one of them. So we can do this one step at a time. Yeah. It's, so we actually have, a, uh, so depending on your vacuum, we have a drift rate of about like 0.02 nanometer. I might be off by one order of magnitude. Uh, point, 0.02 nanometer per hour. But then we have a feedback loop because this allows us to stabilize the cavity resonance. So every 10 minutes, we check. And if it's some or so, we can tune it back. So we can keep them stable forever, basically. Yeah, so the gas tuning always pushes you higher in wavelength. And the laser tuning always does the opposite. So we can stay. So basically, you can keep stable wavelengths forever. Uh, it works out. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, this is kind of like a nice uh, trick. So basically, where we're, headed, where we're headed now is to reach a regime where we, uh, we're aiming to develop these arrays of cavities with uh, spin photon in interfaces in each of them, um, where we can tune uh, these, uh, these emitters uh, onto cavity resonances individually and selectively address them by frequency domain multiplexing. And they're really cool ideas of how to do, let's say, remote entanglement generation in the frequency domain. So we often think about doing photon interference by mixing different spatial modes, but you can also mix different frequency modes. And uh, the photons that are coming out of this structure, they're already in the same spatial mode. So if you wanted to generate indistinguishable photons from cavities that are detuned by a few gigahertz, the only thing you need to do is to send these through an electro-optic phase modulator and you can match the photons to one another. So we're really excited about kind of pushing on this platform to do frequency domain multiplexing and frequency domain uh, Honga Mendel and uh, remote entanglement generation. All right, so this is a summary. Uh, of this part. So uh, hopefully I've shown you that there's kind of really exciting developments with these color centers in silicon. We've shown that you can generate indistinguishable photons from a single G center. Um, this was really encouraging uh, to show that we can do integrated quantum photonics with these emitters. And uh, I've also shown you some uh, kind of early stage results where we're integrating these T centers into waveguides and photonic crystal uh, cavity arrays. All right, in the last few minutes, I'll just go over uh, this 
second work very, very quickly. So uh, this is another uh, effort that we have going on, which is kind of related, um, but with a very different physical platform. So here, what we're working on is to engineer how superconducting circuits interact with defects using phononics. So what's the story here? Um, it turns out the superconducting qubit lifetimes, they're also limited by interactions with defects in solids. So this is actually a known problem in condensed matter physics for many decades. Uh, these defects uh, in amorphous materials called two-level systems, they behave like saturable absorbers. So basically you have some kind of defect, actually it's microscopic structure is not really known. Um, it has two energy levels separated by, let's say five gigahertz, that's resonant with your microwave circuit. And these two level systems, they behave like a saturable absorber and cause energy decay. So far, most of the superconducting kind of circuit community treats this as a black box, bad, and then, you know, do material science, reduce the presence of these defects. So in this project, what we're trying to do is something a little bit different because we have this experience with, you know, thinking about defects and color centers, we wanted to kind of dig deep and understand what's going on and whether we can actually engineer these two level systems. So when your circuit interacts with uh, these two level systems, that's an electric dipole interaction with some P dot E coupling, but ultimately the energy gets dissipated into the bath uh, in your material by some phonon emission, okay? And it turns out that from the superconducting qubit perspective, this entire process is like a Markovian decay process because these two level systems have a very short lifetime of about 100 nanoseconds. So that you know, behaves almost like a Markovian bath. So what we're doing in this project is to actually do cavity QED type experiments, except not with electromagnetics, but with phononics, okay? So we know that if you put an atom in a cavity, you can change spontaneous emission rate, right? It turns out the same thing is true. You can also change the spontaneous emission rate of phonons from a defect if you put it in some specially designed uh, nanomechanical structure. So we put these superconducting qubits on not photonic, but phononic band gap structure. So this is a transmon qubit that we fabricated. What's kind of weird and new here is that the capacitor of this uh, superconducting qubit is now on a phononic metamaterial that looks something like this. So we patterned the silicon uh, with a period of 500 nanometers, and that allows us to engineer the band structure of phonons that the superconducting qubit sees. Okay, so you know, you've studied this in your solid state textbook, right? So we're looking at very low frequency phonons here. What we're doing here is a metamaterial where we can engineer the phonon dispersion. And the most important thing here is that we can open up a band gap for phonons at the frequency of our choice. That's determined by the periodicity of the lattice that you fabricated. So now we have this interesting question of, I have my qubit normally, it sees this Markovian bath, the energy goes into phonon emission in the material. But here, what we're doing is we're removing all the phonon modes that you could resonantly emit into. And the question is, what happens then? So that's a puzzle we started doing uh, some measurements on. Uh, we have some preliminary data showing that if you put this qubit, if you put your qubit in this uh, phononic metamaterial, the dynamics become extremely non Markovian. So basically what used to be like a you know, standard dissipative channel now has some memory. And we did, we're doing currently some experiments where we drive the bath and look at the dynamics of the qubit. And we see some very weird dynamics, um, basically indicating that the bath has long correlation time and long memory. Um, and luckily actually there was a really nice uh, analysis of a similar type of uh, problem uh, in, the, in this nice archive. And we actually have a nice model uh, based on the Solomon equation that describes these incoherent dynamics that we're seeing, uh, which suggests that we are seeing an enhancement in the two level system bath lifetime, as well as some, uh, some improvement in the qubit lifetime uh, as well. So this is very preliminary, but it's kind of hints that, you know, we don't, we can do more by not just engineering the electromagnetics, but also the phonon density of states of the integrated devices that we build. So I think that will become a more and more important uh, design consideration as we try to build better systems.
All right, that's it. So I kind of told you mostly about this, uh, our uh, integrated quantum photonics effort with silicon defects and kind of flashed out some very preliminary work on phononic engineering of uh, superconducting qubit and phonon interactions. And I'll end here by thanking you and thanking all the group members. And I also want to advertise that we have a postdoc opening on the quantum phononics effort. Thanks. All right, thanks, Al, for a great talk. A few questions, uh, Elizabeth. <laughs> a lot of people. <laughs> I think that will get much better. What we're doing there is really some, <clears throat> excuse me. Okay, uh, as you already hinted and correctly guessed, what we're doing here is off resonant excitation. And this kind of by definition creates electron hole pairs. So you're taking charges, you're moving them around, and that's really terrible in terms of the amount of electric field noise that you're generating. I think it's gonna get much better uh, when we go to resonant excitation, but we tried it and it didn't work with the G center. So, I think there's some kind of shelving mechanism uh, that's going on. So there's, when you resonantly excite, there's some metastable state that it gets trapped in. Uh, we try to repump um, for like a couple of weeks. Uh, we couldn't really figure it out. Um, I think it will be figured out, uh, but we just couldn't do it yet. I think no one, to my knowledge, has done that yet. But that uh, we don't see such shelving effects in the T center. So for all, everything I've shown, there's no like, um, there's really no tricks. You just send a laser and that's how we take the data. It's nothing complicated. Okay, I think Simeon is next. Yeah, so for the ground state, the electronic orbital is localized. This delocalization happens in the excited state. So when you have an exciton, then uh, that has some larger uh, wave function. But, you know, there's nothing wrong about a large wave function, you know? Uh, <laughs> emitting what? Uh, no, it's, a, it's, it's like a quantum dot. You can think of it as a quantum dot. The excited state is still a bound state. It's like, a, think of it like a state in, like, inside a quantum well, except here the quantum well is coming from defect potential. Um, you can, I, I don't know if that poses like a fundamental limit, but for the spin coherence, in any case, it's the ground state properties that matter and the ground state wave functions are very localized. Um, I think the excite state has a line width of less than a megahertz. So there's really not a big broadening mechanism even for the excite state. All right, maybe one more. Uh, yeah. So the, we, our photon indistinguishability is, uh, okay, on, at zero time delay, I think it was like 65% visibility or so. It's a two main factors. So our signal to noise wasn't very good. So we still have some background fluorescence and also the timing jitter of our detector. So the time scale I gave you there is 0.4 nanoseconds and our detector timing jitter is around 250 picoseconds. And this is, our model is an exponential, not a Gaussian. So the, the timing jitter is, goes into it, but the 65%, at, at least that's what's on the, or whatever is on the paper, I think is similar to 65%. Uh, is mainly a contribution from those two, yeah. Uh, yeah, so right now we're exciting th these electron hole pairs. So basically it can excite anything that exists. So once we, I mean, for these T-center measurement, when we're doing resonant excitation, 
you put in a lot less power, so that, that that's much less of a problem. Yeah. Okay, I mean, to be honest, maybe... I'm I'm surprised that this you know HOM stuff worked. To be honest, uh, um, <laughs> it was a good surprise. Rarely happens in experiments. You get surprised the other way. All right, we can chat further over lunch.